um, then you you may wish to look into a traditional dual purpose breed. Um, you've got your, your specific layers, you've got your specific meat birds, um, so not very dual purpose. Those ones are, are much more specialised. And then just at the end there as well, you do have show birds there. They're mostly there for their looks, bless them. Um, the pure breeds are sometimes less likely to be vaccinated. We'll go through that in a sec. Um, but just so as you're aware, if you are buying small quantities of slightly fancier birds from uh, a small producer, they may not be fully vaccinated against absolutely everything that you can think of. The egg laying pure breeds tend to be less prolific layers than your hybrid layers, which are your, your sort of commercial layers. Um, they do also have less extreme body types. So your meat pure breed birds or your dual purpose pure breed birds, um, they're not going to be your massive kind of slightly overly chunky uh, meat chickens that you would see in a supermarket. Um, if you do want to learn a little bit more about the types of pure breeds, um, there is a website called poultrykeeper.com, which has a list of, which I find quite handy, not just the breeds themselves, but roughly what type of layer they are. So if they're really, really poor layers, it'll tell you how many eggs you would expect to year from them. Um, if they're actually reasonably good layers for a, a pure breed type of chicken, they, they tell you that as well. Um, you can absolutely swear that, you know, the entire breed is going to be consistent because certainly different familial strains are going to be different, but it gives you a rough idea. So if you are thinking about something a little bit more fancy for Airbnb guests or your own eggs or just a, a bit more of a, a, a unique selling point, um, probably in smaller numbers, you can pop onto the website and look all the, the different ones up. There are different disease predispositions in some really fancy little breeds as well. Um, so you might have heard, for example, that the wee silkies, the ones at the top there, they're a little bit more predisposed to, to something called Marek's disease, which is, is something you may hear a lot of on the chicken forums. Hybrid layers are the, the sort of commercial types. Uh, they're bred to be very, very prolific layers. They're pretty specialised. Nowadays, you can get all sorts of different colours. So you saw in Callum's talk that um, you know a lot of them are your traditional brown hens still. Um, but nowadays, you can get all sorts of different colours as hybrid layers as well. Um, they're all a similar size and shape. They don't really differ from each other um, as much as, as some of the pure breeds do. I think, personally, having sort of bought hybrid layers from medium-sized suppliers, um, which, you know, depending on, on how you're starting off, you may end up buying from a more medium-sized supplier rather than a large supplier. Um, it is worth asking around, um, asking people in your area if, if anybody else has bought from them. Um, some of the, the ones that are bred specifically to be different colours um, and, and also quite prolific layers sometimes, um, some of them are more hardy than others. Some of them are certainly differently suited to the Scottish environment. Um, so, for example, what you see in that picture there um, is just a couple of my black rocks that are uh, lounging about in the sun um, and, and you know they're reasonably good in, in Scottish weather. I have had chickens from medium sized suppliers that seem to be much softer feathered and um, got wet much much more easily um, and definitely didn't look as hardy in the Scottish winters. So it is worth just asking people um, who, who have experience of, of a particular hybrid cross um, if that sounds right for you. Um, so the, some of the larger suppliers, um, and sometimes even the, the medium suppliers, may have a full vaccination protocol for the chickens. Um, so the same sort of vaccination and treatment protocol that you would get for actual commercial um, free-range hens. Hybrid layers will lay a lot of eggs for the first couple of years, and then they do drop off quite sharply. Um, these guys were bred to be prolific layers, and um, they, they were bred specifically to do that uh, for, a, for a fairly short amount of time, which is why, of course, so many hens end up getting rehomed um, through the Hen Welfare Trust and, and you see all these eggs commercials. And that's not to say they, they wouldn't produce a reasonable amount of eggs after they've been rehomed or after they're old. Um, they certainly do still keep producing a lot of the time. It's just you're, you're not getting quite the torrent of eggs that you might get um, in, in the first couple of years there. So sometimes you'll find that traditional breeds lay a bit less 
for perhaps a bit longer. You can never predict the lifespan of a chicken, unfortunately, but um, that is something that, that could uh, broadly be true. And hybrids may lay more eggs for, for a shorter amount of time. Um, and any hen that lays a lot of eggs, um, the, the more sort of reproductively active a hen is, the more chance there is for something to go wrong, um, which is why you might potentially find some people uh, lose a few of their commercial rescues uh, quite early on, whereas perhaps if they'd bought um, if they'd bought some more traditional breeds, uh, they might potentially not be looking at losing quite so much. Um, so th there's a big system of checks and balances. There's a big sort of pros and cons. Um, and nowadays you can get these hybrid layers, which uh, which do lay some of the coloured eggs that previously were really quite the remit of, of some of the pure breeds. That's an example for you of a, a large supplier vaccination protocol. So you can see, and also treatment protocol. And um, so you can see this is just a broad example. Um, you can see that when they're producing these hens up to the point of lay um, to sell on to, to um, egg producers, there is quite a lot of vaccination and treatment that goes on there just to make sure um, that they don't develop infectious disease. On the contrary, if you are buying from a very, very small producer, more, more specialist chickens, you may find that there are not really any vaccinations. They quite often do treat for coccidiosis, which is a wee intestinal parasite. Um, but you, you sometimes find that there isn't that list of vaccinations there. And that's worth keeping in mind simply because if you are going to think about mixing some commercially produced, fully vaccinated, um, sort of heavily kind of treated hens, um, and then you you might bring in some non-vaccinated hens. You might find that there's a potential there for a bit of a problem to arise. Um, I guess we're all very aware these days uh, of what mixing vaccinated and unvaccinated anything, including humans, uh, can sometimes uh, do in terms of risk. And it is the same with the hens as well. I'm not saying you are definitely going to run into problems, but certainly there is the possibility. And we have seen in the past people run into fairly substantial problems with their unvaccinated hens when they're exposed to these vaccinated hens um, that has a, have a bit more resistance to things. Your ex-caged or ex-commercial rescues that we were talking about, they may well be really still quite prolific layers for a year or so, um, but they, they do have quite a big adjustment to environment and diet. So do keep that in mind. These, these chickens are going to come, they're going to have a big lot of adjusting to do um, to their new environment, depending on if they've been previously free range or if they've been previously in a barn or previously in a cage, you may find that they're in a different condition as well. And um, so, you know, we've probably all heard the, the stories of the, the WI ladies knitting chicken jumpers and things like that for some of the, the, the caged ones. Um, it is a, a sudden exposure to, to challenges for some of them, depending on what the previous situation was. They are vaccinated, but these vaccines, like the chickens, were only really designed to last for a certain period of time. So we've also got to remember that if you do have fully vaccinated chickens, that's not to say that they're going to be fully immune to everything throughout their lives. Um, some vaccines may wear off. They're generally, they can generally be in, in poor condition on arrival, depending on what situation they came for, from. So there is a caveat there. Um, you know, that there is going to be a difference between the cage tens and, and ones that have already been stomping around outside for quite some time. And they can carry diseases asymptomatically. So that might mean that these chickens look perfectly healthy to you when they come in, but then you might potentially have an outbreak if you're mixing them with some of your own chickens. Again, that's not to say you're definitely going to have problems. It's just to say these are some things that you can watch out for. Production cycle for layers, if you're just about to start getting your chickens, you're probably thinking about buying them in at point of lay. Roughly 18 plus weeks of age for your hybrid layers. Um, it could be quite substantially longer for some of the traditional breeds. They tend to be laying quite happily at about 20 to 22 weeks of age, but again, that does vary. They'll lay for around about nine to 12 months. Um, so you can get up to sort of 270 eggs. if they're on a seasonal pattern, so we'll talk about artificial lighting shortly. 
And then they, they do also have a molt period, um, which can sometimes be between eight and 12 weeks, where, where you get fewer eggs or sometimes no eggs. And to be quite honest, although that is the generally accepted seasonal um, pattern for chickens, I find sometimes mine's molt in between that as well. Just little, little mini molts where you just get a wee bit less eggs for, for a couple of weeks, um, depending on big weather changes and, and so on. You sometimes get a little mini molt. And then in your second laying cycle for the commercial hybrid layers, you sometimes find um, in their second year there is about a 15% drop in egg production. That's not a huge amount. They're still, they're still working hard. If you are thinking about your housing just now, or if you've already got hens and you're thinking about expanding so that you can sell a few more, um, there are a lot of different types on the market. Um, do check when they sort of recommend to you what the maximum number of hens is, what hens they mean. Some places will say a maximum of X number of hens and what they really mean is a maximum of small hens and then if you have quite large hens you actually are looking at much less. So they might say maximum of 20 hens and it turns out they mean maybe 20 bantams or 15 proper sized chickens. So just double check that otherwise you might find you're overcrowding. You might want to think about what you want roofing wise. We're going to talk about red mite briefly. Um, any crevice that you can't get in there and wash, so for example, under the roofing felt where all the beams are, um, could potentially be a bit of a, a pain if you do get something like red mite. So have a think what your material is going to be um, for, for your, your roofing. And the same if you're converting any existing sheds. Do you want to keep that felted roof or do you want to maybe replace it with something else um, so that you can clean it out if you do get red mite? There's plastic coops, there's wooden coops. Um, that is going to depend pretty much on whether or not you're retrofitting something, what your preference is. Um, whether or not you just want something that's really easily disinfectable and clean. Um, obviously, the size of your flock as well, 20 chickens is a very different proposition from 200. Um, and uh, in addition to cleaning as well, you're going to want to think about um, refreshing the ground or whether or not that's going to mean movement or whether it's going to mean um, having enough space for them to constantly free range instead. So you've got different types of chicken tractors there as well, one where they're unattached and one where you're just moving the house from, from place to place and then there's quite substantial free range in outside that. You do want to check if you're going to go for the run option that there is enough space, uh, same with paddocks sort of in, in between the, the kind of massive free range and, and sort of smaller runs, um, you can divide the, the ground up into to smaller paddocks. Um, versus completely free range and you've got to remember as well if you aren't going for runs which you know a lot of you will be thinking about larger numbers of chickens um, in which case it, it will be more free range and um, you've got to think about contact with wild birds and that's quite important and we'll, we'll um, show you why um, with regards to, to bird flu and things as well. Um, environmental enrichment is really important places where they can go um, to, to have a wee dust bath areas if possible that they can get into a bit of shade and um, these are all things that you can think about down to, to your climate particularly and um, there's obviously a huge difference between the southeast of Scotland and the, the northwest of Scotland and um, so it really does depend if you're trying to keep them out of the wind or if you're trying to keep them out of the rain or if very very occasionally you're trying to give them somewhere to get out of the, the sun so and if you do have Airbnb on your mind um, or farm stay, that kind of thing, and you want the free rangers around just to add a bit of character, just do be aware they're terribly messy. If you haven't had them before, um, they will just come and poop on all your furniture and peer through the windows. They're an absolute delight to have around, but if that is one of the things that you're thinking about um, for your, your egg layers, then do keep that in mind. A good power washer um, and, and a broom for the patio. If you're ret retrofitting some existing buildings, you'll probably be thinking mostly about um, nesting, installing nesting boxes and perches. Now, we've got some good technical notes for the perches. So at the bottom there, I've, I've put down, if you go to our website, sruc.ac.uk, and just search in the search box for technical notes, then I'll give you a drop down box and you can scroll down to the poultry notes. And we've got a really in-depth guide there um, all about 
the best types of perches to put in because you want to put your perches at a space that means that they feel safe so they're slightly up off the ground they do like to, to roost somewhere um, that they feel that they've got away from predators but you've got to make sure there's enough space per bird and you've got to make sure that there's enough space per uh, between the perches so that nobody's pecking anybody else that's slightly above them um, and, and enough space between a perch and the wall so that nobody gets stuck by falling down the back so there's a, a good in-depth guide there on the website Nesting boxes, a good rule per thumb um, of thumb is, is about one pair of four birds. Um, obviously, that, that will vary depending on what your situation is. Um, sited in a dark part of the house or a dark part of the shed or the barn or wherever it is that you've decided um, to, to put your hens, a, a nice dark space is, is quite attractive to them for laying. Um, accessible from the outside or easily accessible for you one way or the other so that you can make sure that it's constantly kept clean and uh, roughly about a foot square is usually about the side uh, or a foot cubed rather um, and, and often some nice bedding in there. I have seen some designs where the bedding is kind of replaced by quite a tactile rubber surface instead. It's a, a sort of almost astroturf like rubber surface, not astroturf itself but that kind of um, bristly shape. Um, to, to try and keep the eggs clean, but also to give them the idea that um, it's a nice, comfortable, nesty spot to lay their egg. So there are various, uh, various quite good designs available, both on the internet and actually, there's a lot of people on social media these days that are just showing what their houses are like and things. And I do quite like social media for that aspect of it. Although I will say, really important to start off with, um, some social media sites do not give good advice in terms of health. So it's nice to see what people are doing with their housing and you know management and things like that. And quite often that that's okay. Um, but in terms of somebody going on an internet uh, social forum and saying, help, my chicken looks like it's doing X, Y, or Z, um, what do I do? quite often the, the advice that comes back ranges from not ideal to really illegal um, in terms of veterinary advice from, from unqualified people. I mean, dangerous and really welfare unfriendly advice. So um, it is a good idea to, to get a few, I, a, a few sort of sources of information that are quite trustworthy. Um, for example, one of my favourites for disease symptoms is a website called chickenvet.co.uk. You can search for your bird's symptoms on it. It is run by vets. Um, it's quite comprehensive. It, you know, it's, it's reliable information. Um, it's, it's quite a good source of information if you are looking for anything about that. Lighting wise, if you're going to aim towards a continuous supply of eggs, so getting a bit more commercial, um, you're going to want to think about installing artificial light lighting. Laying hens do prefer a constant day length of about 14 to 16 hours um, for guaranteed persistency of egg production. So we're talking going into the autumn here um, when most um, free range hens, if they're not sort of housed in a, a kind of commercial environment, if they're not housed in a, a more artificially lit environment, then you'll find that they, they start to fall off with their egg production. Um, so retrofitting a coop, or retrofitting a barn or whatever, um, if you haven't done that before with, uh, with artificial lighting can help to, to deal with that and, and increase your egg production. If you do notice any adverse behavior once you've installed that, so bullying is a bit of a problem in chickens to the point of potential cannibalism, you have to get in there and nip adverse behavior right in the bud. Um, if you do have the, that sort of thing setting in after you, you increase the light levels, you might have to think about reducing them. Maybe not permanently, but certainly until things settle down and then perhaps increase them a little bit again. Um, it's definitely worth taking advice if you see that and acting quite quickly if you do. Diet's fairly self-explanatory. Layers ration is going to be the, the most likely thing that people are, are going to, to go for. Um, because the chickens are most often bought at point of lay, if you are rearing your own chickens, you're going to have to think about a grower's ration 
um, which is, is a different formulation instead. A bit of grit or oyster shell, depending on how you've housed them. Free range hens can quite often pick up a lot of their grit. Um, hens and runs definitely need a bit more of a, a supplementation. Um, it's good stuff to have around one way or the other. You can get nutritional deficiencies if they're on the incorrect diet or if treats are fed at inappropriate times. They should be filling their, their crops morning and evening with layers ration. Um, so try to time any treats mid-afternoon um, to, to make sure they don't stuff themselves um, with the less nutritious stuff. And no kitchen scraps, I'm afraid. That isn't, that isn't legal in this country. Um, garden scraps are fine in moderation, but try not to, to give them any long grass clippings. A brief whistle-stop tour of some of the diseases that influence the advice that we've just given you or the points that we've just asked you to consider when you are expanding or when you are starting out. You'll hear a lot about Marex disease. You might have spotted it on the vaccination protocol for, for, for the, the commercial hens earlier. I, I put a common problem question mark there because it's probably not as common a problem as it seems. Um, if somebody goes on a chicken website and suggests that their hen is lethargic, um, a lot of people are going to suggest to them that it's Marex disease and it could be quite a few other things. Um, I, uh, for the last 10 years, have been doing the post-mortem examinations in Perth. We're unfortunately closed at that site now, but um, the, the backyard or small flock um, post-mortems that we had from either commercial road end uh, egg sellers or, or hobby flocks, um, the Marex wasn't quite as, it wasn't nearly as common as, as, as it turned up in the, the history of the bird that you'd kind of brought in. So, you know, almost always it would say suspect Marex disease on the paperwork um, when we were taking the, the animal in. And it, it, it wasn't Marex disease as often as that. So you will see it talks about a lot. It usually presents as a gradual progressive leg weakness or paralysis. Sometimes they go blind. But you usually see it, if you're going to be buying in your hens, you would normally see it in the younger ones. So the, around about the point of lay when you bought them in. They can get Marex disease much younger, but if you're buying in chickens at point of lay, that's when you're really going to see it. If you've got a six-year-old hen that's gone down with something, it probably isn't going to be Marex disease. It's probably going to be something, uh, something else. It, it tends to be the younger ones that, that go down with it. There isn't an effective treatment, which is why people are so worried about it. Control in commercial flocks is usually based on vaccination as day old chicks. So you can't really buy a point of lay chicken and then get it vaccinated for Marex disease. It is actually part of the chick um, vaccination protocol that, that the people who hatch them and, and rear them on for selling would do. You can think about keeping adult birds and very, very young birds apart for, for as long as possible when you've bought them in. Um, I'm not talking absolute ages, but, you know, just to let them settle in, de-stress, um, because times of stress are definitely times that you're more susceptible to disease. Good hygiene. Um, if you have had a problem, you might want to think about talking to your vet about an all-in, all-out system at some point. We have unfortunately had some wee flocks that have had enough of a Marex problem that they've decided that what they're going to do is they're going to stop with the chickens for a little while and then they're going to restart um, with cleaner ground and so on. That's not something to worry about right at the start, but just be aware, um, you know, it's one of the things that you're thinking about when you're buying in, when you're setting up. There's also in commercial flocks, um, there's selective breeding for resistance. Um, with, with the smaller flocks, we can take some of those um, tips from big commercial flocks, such as the all in it all out system and the good hygiene and maybe sourcing vaccinated flocks, um, sourcing vaccinated stocks, sorry. Um, but yeah, there are, it does become a bit logistically more complicated with smaller flocks. So um, usually if you are affected, want to have a wee discussion with your vet and just try your best to avoid the risk factors, really. We talked about the fact that some Hens will come from vaccinated backgrounds and some hens will come from non-vaccinated backgrounds. Um, Marex disease vaccine doesn't stop them getting the disease, it stops them showing the symptoms. So if you've got a vaccinated chicken and it's had a Marex vaccine, that chicken could still have 
Marex disease to pass on to your unvaccinated chicken, despite the fact that they both start off looking perfectly healthy. So that is that is why we talk about that. Red mite is another one that you're thinking about when you're expanding or setting up, just because it has such a big deal, uh, such a lot to do with the house. They live mostly in the coop. They don't spend a whole lot of time on the chickens. They live in the coop until the night comes, the chickens come in, they come out of the cracks in the coop, they come out from under the perches, they come out from under the roofing felt, and then they climb on the chickens and they have a little blood meal, and then they go back to the cracks that they came from. They can live for a long time without feeding, and not previously a problem in Scotland, but slightly more in the last few years, um, really hot heat sort of temperatures and um, warm temperatures heat waves uh, which we've had a little bit of in Scotland over the last few years can really exponentially increase their life cycle so they can they can reproduce very very fast when it's warm so around about this sort of temperature this is this is the this is the week this week and last week because I am really checking my chicken coops really carefully for red mite because I know that this is the sort of weather that they increase quite fast in. So depending on what you're doing in terms of housing, if you're retrofitting a barn or a, a shed, or if you're buying in a coop, that could play into your, your decisions. They can nibble on people too, they won't live on you, but if you find that you're getting really itchy when you're cleaning out coops, um, just have a good look at your, your arms and the crevices of the, the coop. There is another type of mite called the northern fowl mite. Um, they do live on the birds. They only survive a few weeks without feeding, but they are also a blood sucker. Um, so when you buy in your birds, looking under the wings of some of them and looking around the vent of some of them, that's quite a good way to just double check that nobody's bringing in any mites. If they do have mites, they might be lethargic, fluffed up. There'll be probably quite a few of them affected. You can see a, a drop in the number of eggs you get. Um, and unfortunately, it can be fatal if you've got a really bad infestation. Feathers around the vent, they can become blackened with dry blood, or you can just see the mites there. So, for example, for the northern fowl mite, this is the sort of grubbiness that you would see um, on, on the, the feathers around the vent. And red mites, this is what they look like. And as I say, you generally would find them in the coop rather than on the bird. Um, they all come in with wild birds. They're quite universal mites. So if you do have free range hens, then you are probably going to have to, to keep a wee eye out that these guys haven't moved into your, your coop as well. That is a plant mite that always causes people to panic um, because you'll see them quite often in your garden when you're aware of them. Um, but there's a slight difference. You'll see the, the size of the legs. So proper red mite. Is it just looks like a little bean. Um, you don't really see the legs very much and it's quite dark and shiny. A red spider mite that's eating all your plants, um, he's got big long legs and is, he's much more orange and you'll quite often see him crawling around on your chicken coop. It can give people a bit of a panic. Treatment is kind of arduous. Um, it, it's, it's very treatable, but it, it does take a bit of effort. Biosecurity is good, so think about treating your chickens on purchase. Um, with regards to your coop, if you do have a red mite infestation, you're going to have a really thorough wet cleaning. You're probably going to need good chemical disinfectants or house treatments. There are house treatments available for red mites as well. Um, you're going to be looking specifically for mite products, um, ones that do specify that they don't just deter mites, they actually treat mites because you'll see a lot of products that, that suggest they deter mites. That's not really much good if you've got a problem. Um, putting diatomaceous earth in the dust baths of the chickens um, can help them. It, it helps them treat themselves. Um, the mites don't do well with diatomaceous earth. It's just a powdery substance. There are treatments that you can get from the vet, um, but they, they, you know, the, the, there is going to be an egg withdrawal involved. So you, you are going to have to think about keeping your eggs away from sale for a specified period of time if you use a chemical treatment for the chickens themselves. In some cases, that will be unavoidable if you have a really bad infestation and you cannot get on top of it with your, your powders and your diatomaceous earth and your chemical disinfectants and your thorough cleaning of the houses, you're, you may end up having to use uh, a proper treatment. Um, but it will come with an egg withdrawal. 
that's a couple of names of the uh, disinfectants that are specifically thought to be particularly good for red mite. Steam cleaning is a possibility. Getting the right house design to start with, uh, either very take apartable, um, very sort of break downable, or with good um, materials that don't leave a lot of crevices. Um, if you don't see things getting better very quickly, it is something you want to have to chat to your vet about, um, just because it can can rapidly get quite quite bad. Um, and as I say, sometimes it can be fatal. I've certainly post mortemed plenty of, of hens that have been part of a, a red mite outbreak. And the most important thing to remember is when you are treating the house and treating the hens and so on, you're going to need a repeat treatment a couple of weeks later. It's not just a one and done. That's why we say it's a bit on the arduous side. And the last thing to talk about really uh, tonight would be um, notifiable disease. Uh, there's a couple of those in Scotland. It's a disease that you have to tell the local um, veterinary office about, the local APHA office about. Um, one of them is called Newcastle disease. Um, it's something that would be very obvious. It's, it's usually nervous signs in your chickens and you would want to speak to your vet about that quite quickly. The other one um, is bird flu, it's avian influenza. And we've probably, a lot of us have heard a lot about that this year. Um, for those of you that haven't kept hens, you may not be aware, there was a big chicken lockdown uh, over winter last year, as well as a human lockdown. So if you haven't come across that before, this is going to be a big decision maker for your um, for your chicken housing and for your idea of how much capacity you have to keep hens. There's a couple of really good posters available um, produced by the Scottish Government and partners. Um, the reason that we have bird flu at the moment, um, we have had an outbreak of bird flu uh, over the winter is migratory patterns of wild birds. Um, so a, a couple of years ago, there was another outbreak. It doesn't at the moment happen in Britain every year, but they so far have tended to expand. Um, we're not sure how that's going to, that's going to um, proceed over the next few years. We're not sure if they're going to get more common and we'll see one every year or if they're they're going to get more widespread. Um, certainly a lot more birds affected last year. Um, but it's, it's due to the migratory patterns of wild birds. They come into the country over winter and, uh, and some of them will be carrying strains of bird flu from different countries from where they've stopped off on their way. So we sometimes get a bit of an outbreak over winter. When that does happen, um, you, you may find that we have another check in lockdown. It's a virus, it's a flu virus, um, same, same sort of ideas as human flus. Um, it can be carried into buildings on objects. So when we do have an outbreak, you'll find that there's usually hygiene regulations to make sure that everything's kept cleaner. It can affect any type of flock, um, especially birds that would have contact with wild birds, which is the reason for the chicken lockdown, if you like, um, is, is to try and make sure that we don't end up with, with chicken outbreaks. It can be really serious in terms of, you know, for example, a few years ago in the last outbreak, somebody had emailed me saying, I really don't see why um, we don't just let all these chickens get the bird flu and, and be immune. So that, that was a that was quite prescient. Um, that that was something that maybe was a, was a bit of a foreshadowing for for other things. Um, but at the time, I explained to her that there had been an out, an outbreak of bird flu on a turkey farm um, of about three thousand turkeys, and uh, and when they turned up to cull the ones that were left, um, about sort of ninety percent of the birds had already by, died by themselves. You know that some strains can be really really quite fatal. Um, so don't worry about it too much in terms of not knowing about it. Um, if something did happen to your flock, you would probably be aware of it very early on. And also, if you're registered, you'll be told when an outbreak is happening. You'll be told about the risk levels. If you haven't registered your flock, you could think about the voluntary registration that Callum uh, talked about. And, uh, and that would give... The, the government an idea of where you are to be able to give you the information. Um, it's something that basically you don't worry about, but you try and prepare for. You know, it's common sense. It's, it's good, sensible working. 
the strains are named for the type of H and N proteins that live on the, the surface of the virus. Um, so you'll hear a lot of H5N1 or H1N1. It's just different strains of the flu. And different strains sometimes have different behavior. You may also hear people talk about high pathogenic or low pathogenic. It's basically just the severity. So high pathogenic flu is really quite bad. That's the type that I was talking about that killed a lot of the birds before they could turn up to kill them um, because of the outbreak. Um, they, they do have quite bad respiratory problems. They'll have swollen heads. Um, you see a, a bit of diarrhea, perhaps a big drop in the amount of eggs laid. So it would be really dramatic. Um, we fortunately do not have a lot of outbreaks in this country in hens because when the risk level goes up from the wild birds, if necessary, the government steps in and makes sure everybody gets their chickens into, into isolation away from the wild birds. There is a low pathogenic form, which is less serious. And it's a bit, bit more just mild diarrhea and so on, or mild breathing problems. Um, and again, we don't see a lot of that either. So I want everybody to be aware of it, but not absolutely worried about it. It's not a massive feature of chicken keeping. The main thing that you're going to have to think about if you're expanding to, to sell more eggs or if you're getting chickens is if we have another chicken lockdown over next winter or the winter after, and you're told you need to, to make sure that your birds are kept away from wild birds. So that means housing them or it means putting them in a secure run that birds can't poop through the roof of. How are you going to do that? Um, because I know a lot of people just get their chickens and everything's fine and then they realise they've got to go from free range to house chickens all of a sudden over the winter and it can be a nightmare if you've not prepared. It's spread from bird to bird. It can be spread in body fluids, so that's faeces, um, for example. It's not airborne over large distances, but you can carry it on contaminated clothing or equipment. So they talk about boot dips and disinfectants when you're going into your chicken house, for example, so you're not trampling faeces from outside into your uh, bird's housing. This prevention zone that we had last year, uh, the housing order, um, it initially became uh, was put in place featuring enhanced hygiene requirements. So it was talking about disinfectants, uh, good biosecurity, that kind of thing. And then it actually progressed into a compulsory housing office, a uh, housing order. Um, and that's for, for the, the chickens, turkeys and ducks. Um, but if you if you do find yourself in a prevention zone, you can't house these things together. Um, you're supposed to try and keep the water birds like ducks away from the poultry like chickens. Um, and that's because they show disease slightly differently. And some of them are more susceptible than others. If compulsory housing, if, if your housing is absolutely not possible, you really want to try for a complete separation from contact with wild birds. So for example, um, in that wee picture down the bottom there, they've sighted their house not that well because it's right under the, the trees where all the wild birds will be sitting and pooping everywhere. But on the other hand, they do have a covered part to the run, which does help. So you've got pros and cons in that picture there. Covered run is good, right under the trees where everything's sitting and pooping, not so good. Um, and you, you will have to take practical steps to keep your different species separate if you happen to have them. And you just want to make sure particularly that your chicken food and chicken water is not accessed by wild birds. A couple of good guides and then we'll let you pop off. Um, there's a detailed handout that is available on the gov.uk website. Um, there is fact sheets uh, and posters available, and we can send you the, the links for those. What it all means for you is really you're just needing to consider how you're going to cope with that if it happens again, because I do think it's relatively likely. Um, it's, we're certainly not guaranteeing it's going to happen every year, uh, hopefully, but uh, certainly it's, it's something you're going to have to think about as a chicken keeper. And it is, it is a bit of a stress. Um, if you're not prepared, if you've already got your plan right, fine, we're going to put them in the polytunnel, we're going to put them in the old barn and clear it out, whatever, um, then that's great. If not, then you're you're stressed and you're running around. People have repurposed all sorts of things um, to, to make sure that their chickens are covered and safe. Um, 
so so do have a wee look around and, and if if you need to just uh, ask your your local vet or ask your local consultant if that sounds excuse me um, if that sounds like a good alternative we've got a bit of a grade one woofer there she's uh, she's a bit on the old side sorry about that biosecurity is going to involve having good boots equipment disinfectant perhaps clothing that you don't mind getting in contact with disinfectant and making sure that your visitors aren't tracking through all your birds and, and vehicles there are definitely approved um, disinfectants and uh, you can also think depending on the size of your place uh, the size of your premises you can think about vehicle wheels and things as well how your bedding is stored how your food and water is stored before it gets to the chickens um, nice secure housing and so on updates can come to you from your vet from ourselves sruc from the animal and plant health agency your your local um branch from the farm advisory service the scottish government website obviously has a lot of resources there um, and that's the the link for the registration for your poultry callum's already covered that that's just registering your poultry if you have more than 50 uh, compulsory or if you have less than 50 you can do it um voluntarily and just to add that um pigeons ostriches emus rios and cassowaries are also included i have had a crofter with rias before so i thought i'll just put that in there in case there's another one of you out there and be prepared not worried there's always lots of people ready to give good advice that was the big stushy over the winter that is you know something that you definitely want to keep in mind if you're going to expand your chicken operation or if you're going to get more chickens but it's it's just a case of being prepared 